Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the final of three candidate forums brought to you by the City of San Jose in conjunction with the Bay Area News Group, Mercury News, and Metro Newspapers. On-site voter registration will be provided in the lobby by the Santa Clara Registrar of, Video <laughs> Santa Clara Registrar of Voters, and they'll also be recruiting for Election Day volunteers if you're inclined to volunteer for that. Uh, tonight's forum has been modeled after a template provided by the nonpartisan League of Women Voters. We thank all these organizations. Uh, we thank all these organizations. I'm reading off a script. Pardon me. <laughs> we, thank all these, we thank all these organizations for their contributions and assistance in conducting these forums. Tonight's host is eBay, which has been in San Jose for over 20 years. eBay is the pioneer and market leader in internet commerce, where the world goes to shop. With 164 million active buyers and 1 billion live listings, eBay has a, in addition, has a long history of philanthropy, contributing over $35 million to nonprofit organizations. Thank you, eBay, for providing this venue at no cost this evening. We ask that no videotaping be done this evening by the audience, as the entire event is being filmed, and it is unfair to use a snippet of tonight's forum without providing the entire background. The video from tonight's forum will be posted at sjdistrict6.com and will also air on the Community Access Channel. You can watch the September 14th and 28th forums online that were co-moderated co by Mercury News journalist Ramona Giwargis and Metro newspaper editor Josh Kane. We ask that the audience please refrain from applauding or making audible noises tonight during the question and answer period so that we may accommodate as many questions as possible. Since the format of candidate forums does not always lend itself to a definitive yes or no response, residents may wish to consult the District 6 Voter Transparency Project, which provides a public rec voting record for candidates and was designed to lend transparency to the process. The Transparency Project lists 70 City Council agenda items over the past 12 months that participating candidates have provided their viewpoint. This can also be found at sjdistrict6.com or I have a paper copy for attendees this evening after the forum. Questions for tonight's voter information event have been submitted by various residents of District 6, not interest groups. We've received questions from residents of Cahill Park, College Park, Corey, Hamilton Place, Midtown, Rose Garden, Shasta Hatchet, St. Leo's, Palm Haven, Pamlar, and Willow Glen neighborhoods. Now to our candidates. Both of our distinguished candidates survived a competitive primary and received the most votes from an original field of eight candidates. Both are similar in many ways. Both are transplants to San Jose. Both are married with two children that are either currently enrolled in or have already graduated from San Jose Public Schools. Both are past presidents of their respective neighborhood associations. Both have served as city commissioners rotating in his chair. And both include animal companions as part of their immediate family. And perhaps what is most amazing, the streets named Chapman Street and Davis Street intersect in the Rose Garden neighborhood. Phenomenal, just amazing. Uh, both our distinguished candidates have a variety of supporters. Candidate Chapman being endorsed by labor unions, county supervisors Chavez, Cortezzi, and Yeager, while candidate Davis is endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Herrera, and former Mayor Reed. This is a partial list for both candidates. At this time, please join me now with a hearty round of applause welcoming our candidates in the order in which they will appear on your ballot, Dev Davis and Helen Chapman. We flipped a coin to see who would go first. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question, and then both candidates will provide a one-minute rebuttal opportunity for each question. If a candidate chooses to use the extra time, then simply raise your hand, the mo and the mo raise your hand. The moderator may also modify the amount of time for responses. This, e this evening also provides an opportunity for each candidate to ask each other three questions. Candidates, please be sure to keep timekeepers in your sight as they will signal your time is nearly up or to stop. That's Brendan and Philip. Uh, I then should like to introduce at this time our co-moderator for the evening, journal journalist Julia Baum. They say the pen is mightier than the sword, but your local reporter slash professional belly dancer wields both with equal skill. Julia came on board with the resident newspaper last year as an editorial reporter and is taking credit tonight for teaching Hillary Clinton that infamous shoulder shimmy from the first presidential debate. As a transplant from the state capital of Sacramento, she brings an outsider's perspective to the local political scene and is passionate about sharing resident stories. She's a graduate of California State University, Sacramento. 
Thank you, Julia, for your volunteering to be here tonight and for your contribution to local news coverage. Julia has reviewed the questions submitted by residents of District 6 and has selected which questions will be asked this evening. Julia may modify or reword some questions for the purposes of clarity and brevity, and Julia may ask also her own questions. And we will start off that I get to ask the first question, I think. And that question, and the, the, the flip was won by Helen, so Helen's going to go first. And we have our little tag to remind us who goes. So now I'm going to turn it to Dev for the next one. And here we go. And this one is from Anthony R. on Carolyn Avenue in Willow Glen. And Anthony has a two-part question for you on the purpose of government. Government should be involved in some things and should not be involved in other things. So his questions are, number one, what is the purpose of government as you see it? And two, what are examples of things specifically to local government we should be involved in or should minimize our involvement in? And that's to Helen. Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Helen Chapman, um, and I live in the, the Shasta Hanchet neighborhood. Um, I view local government really as helping people that can't help themselves. And that would be people that are on moderate or low income or people that just need um, extra tools in terms of services, you know, like where is access to, um, if you need help with traffic calming or if you need help with uh, um, library access or you need have questions regarding public safety or road improvement or many of those things. Some of the, those things are things I hear at the door very, very often. And a lot of times government can just help move you through the system quicker at a faster pace. You know, they're there to help and assist. Um, where government doesn't necessarily need to be in the way is sometimes, you know, it's in community projects. In the case where we did the Alameda, beautiful way, we didn't really go through the city project, the city process as per se. Um, this one is where our own uh, neighborhood association board member wrote the grant. We hired our own uh, consultant based on an RFP that we did ourselves. And that person brought an outside traffic engineering person in, and that helped drive the process a little bit different than city hall. So that's where I see the difference. And, and just to clarify the question, uh, examples of what government should be involved in, I think that was pretty clear. What are some things at the local level the city should not be in? Should not be involved in? Um, hi. What color I paint my house? Dev, same question. And if you need questions repeated, please feel free to ask the moderators. Thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Dev Davis. I really think that the main function of the city of San Jose, which is a charter city, is to fulfill our requirements for our charter, to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars, and to provide for the core services that the residents have been promised. Police, fire, all public safety, roads, parks, and libraries. I think those should be the focus. And I also think it's important for government to minimize burden on taxpayers by preparing for economic downturns and putting money aside. What we should not be involved in at the city level are the social services that are in the purview of the county government that the state provides dollars for through the county. So mental health services, for example, would be, would be one thing that the city should not be providing those services because that's in the purview of the county. Thank you. This next question is from Phil R. on Camino Pablo in Willow Glen. Phil writes, which San Jose city council and mayoral campaigns have you volunteered on in the last four years? Please include both winning and losing campaigns. And we start with Dev. Um, I've attended events for Mayor Licardo's uh, campaign, but I have not been involved in any uh, local races at the city council or mayoral level directly for for the campaigns. I have um, I have knocked on doors for assembly member candidates, but not for city council member candidates. In the last four years, um, I believe I assisted Mayor Licardo, and I believe I assisted, um, four years, I'm trying to remember. Um, most of the campaigns I've been involved with have been measures, um, not necessarily council candidates. This next 
the, actually the next two questions are from Jeff Liu, or on, <laughs> sorry Jeff, on Clarkway and Willow Glen. Um, the first one is, should the city require negotiations with public employee contracts to be open to the public? Helen. I don't see why not. Um, there are some things that are probably confidential in terms of uh, pay scale and benefit level, but I think, you know, that much as we can make it open to the public, I think it helps transparency and it certainly is a process so that we don't have the division that's been created in the city as of this time. I agree. I think we need more transparency in government. That's why I have participated in the voter transparency project that Pierre Luigi was talking about. And I have posted all of my reasonings for uh, each of those uh, council agenda items on my own website. So yes, I do think that we need to have uh, open negotiations. It prevents the, the he said, he said on who was on which side of the table. And it just brings more sunshine. We have sunshine laws and public meeting laws in, in our state. At, and in our city and this is just one more thing it's the only thing that happens behind closed doors now and it would be the last thing that shed a little sunshine and and make things better all right um just a quick follow-up with helen just so i'm clear on your answers so you mentioned um salaries and that sort of thing being uh private confidential is that do you include that as part of your um support for transparency with the public in these negotiations or I'm just asking for clarity. I think is like with any job, if you're negotiating for a salary, like, you know, if you're going to work for eBay or you're going to work for Cisco, you know, if you're negotiating for a salary, that should be between the employer and the employee. Okay. Thank you. So all of the salary and benefits for every city employee are available on the website. So I'm not sure why negotiations uh, for salary and benefits would happen behind closed doors when what they actually end up getting is something that, that we all have available to us after the fact. Okay, the second one, also from Jeff on Clarkway, asks, should the city remove the conflict of interest that exists with public elected officials being the body to approve public employee benefit contracts what about a citizen panel of taxpayers from neighborhoods having consequential input on negotiations and we start with dev i think that's a really interesting idea my understanding which may not be complete, but my understanding is that the city officials who are part of the contract negotiations are not actually members of any of the unions that are party to, to the negotiations on the other side of the table. So the way that the government, the city staff is set up now, there is a, a differential with city employees doing the negotiating and city employees um, on the other side of the table being uh, the the representatives of, of the city council. Can you repeat the question again? The question was, should the city remove the con conflict of interest that exists with public elected officials being the body to approve employee, uh, public employee benefit contracts? What about a citizen panel of taxpayers from neighborhoods who have consequential input on negotiations? So not understanding what the conflict of interest um, provision is um, well he says that the conflict of interest is the public officials being the body to approve these contracts okay so he would like to remove the public officials from approving the contracts I'm trying to understand that I think that's what the question yeah yeah and yeah he's asking specifically about okay. the uh, citizen panel Anytime we can, we can impart the citizens into the public process, you know, is, is always preferable in my opinion. And just for everyone's background, uh, when the city of San Jose has contract negotiations for uh, benefits and wages, the um, city manager has uh, basically staff that are the representatives to bargain with the labor union 
and then they confer with the city council and get direction and then they meet with the labor union representatives and have meetings and then whenever there's an agreement then eventually as uh, David said then that agreement would be public on the website prior to the city council voting uh, at least one week beforehand okay so this one comes from Bruce on errata court and his question is developers and politicians avoid these interrelated topics too many people and not enough water most people I know and talk to are more worried about water supply than anything else and that expanding population makes the situation worse we do not think this is a state sustainable condition what do you plan to do about this situation and I think this one's for Helen that's an excellent question. I've had that question asked of me a few times, and it's something really seriously to consider, which is, again, why I don't believe that we should be expanding into Coyote Valley, that we should keep, um, you know, if we're going to develop, it should be continue to be infill development, and we shouldn't be spreading out into our foothills and into Coyote Valley because water is a finite resource. And as we continue to add population, that is going to be a considerable issue to, to consider. Um, we also need to be looking at any type of water sources, whether it's going to be using recyclable water, purple pipes, those type of things. And I think that's going to be the next big discussion we have. Dev? I think we do need to look at recycled water and start using that in our new developments um, and purified water. There is enough water available if we recycle what we use. The gray water usage um, re able to be reused is has tremendous potential. I, I also would caution people, if we don't have more people, if we if we stop building developments, what will happen is our out of control housing prices will get more and more out of control. We have to expand the supply of housing to keep the costs in check. So that's one of the reasons why the city council continues to approve development projects for housing because the demand is already there. We have 330 days of sunshine. I know we didn't have a sunshiny day yesterday or the day before, but we have 330 days of sunshine every year. People want to live here. I come from North Dakota originally. That's where I grew up. Let me tell you, 330 days of sunshine is very preferable to six months of snow. <laughs> You're always going to want to have people living in the, the cradle of innovation in America. We have to build more housing to accommodate those people so that my kids, when they grow up, can afford to live and work here and the prices aren't out of their, out of their reach. We had a follow-up question on this one as well, which was, what do you say as the next council person to people who simply do not want any more housing as they feel San Jose already has too many people for all the issues, not enough water, traffic, just too much? And that will go back to Helen as a follow-up. Um, I, you know, and I, and I can foresee that happening. I, and I especially look around Westfield Valley Fair and in the Cory neighborhood where there's an awful lot of it, development happening there. And the infrastructure is not keeping up with development. I, you know, I'm going to push back on developers is make sure that we are building responsibly, that what we are building is sustainable, and that it does take care of the infrastructure around it, like we're putting in adequate public transportation, especially in high density areas, and that we're putting in retail and we're, you know, the components that keep people local instead of driving out of San Jose and, and keeping them in here. It's a difficult topic. You can't say no to development because we are going to continue to grow, but we have to grow responsibly. So the, the question, which was the follow-up question, is what do you say as the next council person when people say, I just don't want any more housing built? There's not enough water. There's too much traffic. There's too many people. Stop city council. So I say exactly what I said to my, in my previous answer, which is, do you have kids? And do you want them to be able to live here when they grow up? I have kids who are 10 and 11 years old. I want them to be able to afford to live in the Bay Area and hopefully in San Jose because this is such a great city and I want them as close to me as possible. If we don't keep building, those prices will be even more out of reach than they already are. So that's my first answer. And, and then I continue to talk about we do need better transit. We need VTA to connect with Caltrain and to synchronize their schedules. And when BART opens in Berryessa next year, we're going to need VTA to con connect with BART and to synchronize those schedules. Because if people can 
go on transit for their entire commute, they'll do it if it's convenient, and they'll get in their cars, like I do, to drive the one mile to the Deardon station, because VTA takes 20 minutes to get to that one mile, because it's not synchronized with, with the train schedule that I take. So I think better transit is definitely one component. We also need to have more walkable and bikeable city streets and trails. So connecting the trails is also a way to take cars off the road because people will choose more convenient options if more convenient options than their car are available. I also think it is important to have environmentally sound buildings. The new building designs have very good, uh, very efficient water usage, and m almost all of them are LEED certified at some level, which means that they're using environmentally sound practices and designs. All right. This next question is actually a um, hybrid of two questions received from Lisa on Norman in Willow Glen and Judith Smith on University Avenue in Rose Garden. Um, the question is, what kinds of existing programs and new initiatives and services would you support to help the city's homeless population? And we're starting with Dev. So I was talking earlier about what's appropriate for the city versus what's appropriate for the county to provide services. For the city, providing safety and sanitation is important and making sure enough housing gets built is important. So the services themselves, that needs to be done at the county level. And in fact, the county is working on that. They have a, an, a contract that is a paper for, for performance contract with Abode Family Services. So we're working in partnership with them already in multiple places. One of them is at 701 Kirtner, um, which is a a facility that was built with affordable housing dollars from the city, but is now being managed by abode services through a county contract. Another one is uh, the old Santa Clara Inn on the Alameda. It is being managed by the, the re renovations were, were funded by the city, but it is being managed by abode family services through the county contract. I think it's really important to have those those partnerships with the county so that the services can be provided while the city focuses on providing, again, the core services for safety and sanitation for the homeless population and all of the residents. Uh, we have a chance to approve Measure A, which is the affordable housing bond. Again, it's a countywide affordable housing bond, so that way this doesn't just put the burden on San Jose. It also gives dollar resources to other cities around so they can also try to increase the affordability of housing. Because you know San Jose has taken on the lion's share of housing recently, and then we are known as the bedroom community of Silicon Valley. Um, and you know, when we're told that 60% of what we should be building is affordable, that's a pretty staggering number. I'm very happy to see the governor sign two bills. One is AB 2176, which is the tiny homes, which will allow us another option in order to build some type of homeless housing that has got a permanent roof with, a, you know, a zip code and, and some utilities that are attached to the home. So that way you've got dignity for the person to be able to live there and transition from out of homelessness into some transitional housing and formally into permanent housing. We also have the secondary unit, um, which is the um, establishment of granny units, which are in cases um, in the neighborhoods like myself, where we've got a house and a half right next door, which allows someone else to be able to live behind you and you're not increasing the density of the existing neighborhood. In fact, you're almost keeping in style with the neighborhood, and so that's something that the council can work on in the coming future. I, I might have one follow-up to that one. Um, secondary units in the United States are coming under siege from some city councils and some cities because um, these, they're not being used for permanent housing, but they're being used for Airbnb and VRBO. Do you believe the city should restrict Secondary, uh, the secondary units that Helen had just explained, do you think those should be only for permanent occupancy or is it okay to do short-term rental? Let's start with Dev, if that's all right. I think it's okay to do short-term rental. We already have an ordinance about uh, Airbnb and short-term rentals for regular housing units. I think it should apply equally to, to the secondary units. 
Uh, my priority would be to ease the affordability. And, you know, and so again, uh, nice to move my son out into the backyard so that he has his own place. <laughs> Instead of living in my house, that would be great. And I've talked to several other residents that would like to do the same thing. Um, you know, or, you know, maybe to provide a teacher or, you know, somebody that needs the housing. I think that would be my priority first. And just to clarify, then, the preference on secondary units is long-term versus short-term rental. Correct. And I guess now's the time for the candidates to ask each other a question. And for this one, it's Helen. And you ask the question. It's the same time limits, et cetera, for, for Dev. Dev, we've been to how many, 30 candidate debates? I think I'm getting to know you pretty well. <laughs> and I think we've answered a litany of questions based on so many different situations. I really, at this point, I, I don't have a question to ask you. I don't think that's, that we haven't gone over with. And then, Dev, you have an opportunity to ask a question of the other candidate. Okay. Um, I, I do have a question. And it is that we, before we had all of these candidate debates, <laughs> you will remember that we had many endorsement processes and questionnaires to fill out, which you filled out. But at the same time, you decided not to fill out the, the transparency project and answer those questions on city council agenda items. Can you talk about your thinking about why you did one and not the other? Um, I think you know with the with the uh, the questionnaires that you fill out, you're able to provide you know um, your thought process behind it. You just don't answer, you know check the box yes or no. You ha you know there's some thought that goes into it, and um, you know and a reasoning behind that. Um, I am always very open. I have been asked hundreds and hundreds of questions from voters and online, and anybody that contacts me, I get right back to them, and I'm happy to tell people how you know how my my thought process works. It's not everything in life is black or white or yes or no. I think there's a process that goes along, and sometimes you know your mind can be swayed depending on information that you receive at the last minute. And so you know I tend again to default with the community and to listen to their concerns first. And uh, you know I'm a council member that listens first and reacts second. So just so everybody knows, I do have my thought processes on each of the 70 questions that we've answered on my website. So I, I, the votes are posted every, every week, and my thought process is posted on my website along with the endorsement questionnaires from, from the primary, and I haven't filled out any new questionnaires um, either. So uh, all of that is available for everybody, not just the people who, happen to catch, who I happen to catch at the door uh, when I'm knocking on doors. And just, you know, we did take into account, you know, the number of questions that, you know, very similar questions. And we do have an FAQ set um, list on our website for the most commonly asked questions. And those answers are posted on the website along with the questionnaires that I did fill out. And just so everyone understands the transparency project, candidates can answer the question after the council meeting. So they have the privy of watching any discussion that's transpired. And I think it's now you, uh, Julia. All right. Thank you for answering that. To steal from Josh Kane at the last debate, I'm sure that wasn't awkward at all for anyone. Okay, so um, this next question is from me. So, many residents in District 6 and citywide have been complaining about the garbage at freeway, <coughs> freeway entrances and exits. What many residents don't realize is that those areas are the property of the state. Should the city fine Caltrans for not cleaning up its property, or should the city clean it up and then bill Caltrans? And we're going to start with Dev. So is this a pick one, or oh, or I don't understand. Is the question pick this? I can repeat it if you'd like. Pick the bill Caltrans or fine yes. them. Yes. Should the city should the city fine Caltrans for not cleaning up its property, or have the city clean it up and then bill Caltrans? I believe this is going to the council soon, right? Rules yeah, or rules committee. Yes. Okay, so I actually think it probably has more standing to clean it up ourselves and then bill Caltrans. Not, I don't know whether they would pay um, because I'm not sure about the legality of fining another governmental organization. Uh, but I do think either way that Caltrans should pay for the cleanup. We have some really disgusting freeway interchanges and off-ramps um, 
I, I see bird most often. I hear, uh, I hear about Meridian's exit, and, and I saw Bascom's last weekend when I was walking up in that neighborhood. They are all terrible, and we really need to push Caltrans to do something. And I would actually encourage all of you to, to contact your state senator whether that's State Senator Jim Bell or someone else, and your assembly member, whether that's assembly member Evan Lowe or someone else, to really get them to push Caltrans to do their job because we as a city, we haven't gotten a lot to talk about the fiscal issues, but we as a city are um, not fully funding our core services as it is, our police, our fire, especially our roads, and our parks and our libraries. So going and doing another government's job is not something that we have a ton of money to do, like maybe Palo Alto. Um, they, they do that and they don't bill Caltrans, but I think as a city that is a, a jobs poor city, we actually need to do that because we don't have the revenue to be able to, to clean those freeways ourselves when it's not actually our job to do that. Um, I can actually tell you a conversation I just had with Senator Jim Bell, who has endorsed my campaign. His office is going to take the lead on those calls, and as soon as I can get to my phone, I don't want to get it out now and give you the phone number, but please see me after, and I will be happy to give you the contact of the aide that's taking those calls, and he wants to keep track of those so they can report back to Caltrans. I think, you know, Senator Jim Bell has the, has the ability to go after more transportation dollars in terms of trying to get more funding for Caltrans in order to start doing it. They know it's a serious issue. There are homeless encampments all along Meridian Avenue, for one. I know we've been constantly calling them, and I know there's fences down by City College, and that's how they're getting in. They can't keep up with the number of calls. So this is something that his office has promised me they are going to take the lead on. So please see me afterwards, and I'll be happy to give you the name and phone number. And I looked up that phone number for Jim Bell, Senator Bell. It's 408-558-1295. Okay, next one's for me. This one is uh, going to start off with Helen. It's from Suzanne on Ellis Avenue in Willow Glen. And she says, we need a change to building codes. These teardowns being replaced by monster houses are sucking up all of the light and overbuilt on tiny lots are ruining our areas by property owners that don't care about our community. Will you improve the situation by requiring neighborhood approval of new house plans and require builders to build only homes that fit within the current architecture of the neighborhood? Councilman Rolivier, I remember you and I talking about neighborhoods of distinction years ago and trying to work on, um, you know, that that would allow us to preserve some of the historic integrity within some of our very historic neighborhoods. And it, I know within planning it never got very far, and I know you've tried to bring it forward. Um, and I would like to continue to see that happen because, you know, we are a city of great neighborhoods. You know, you walk around this city and it's a beautiful place to walk. And I know I've walked. I walked a lot. <laughs> And I can tell you, I've enjoyed looking at the homes and walking the tree-lined streets. And I think it's something to be enjoyed. And there are times you can see a huge lot. And I did see one in particular that I saw steel beams going up. I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be one huge home. And I can really understand where the neighbors having concerns about the size of the home next to existing homes there that are not in consistent size. So, um, and I also think what we need to have urban design guidelines. Our planning department isn't doing much with that right now. They're just trying to play catch up with the number of development proposals coming forward. But what's missing is the integrity of the building that's going on and this, the development of those designs. And I think that's a lot what we care about when we look around the neighborhood and we look at homes. You want to see quality projects going forward. And then just as a specific follow-up to her question, would you require adjacent neighbors to approve the construction of the new house? I don't know if we can do that, but I've certainly they could have input. Uh, so a city can create any ordinance it wants in, in regards to that. So it's just, would, do you favor that or not? I have no opinion on that right now. Okay. And the same question for Dev. Do you need to repeat it? or? I think I'm good. Okay. So we have to balance two things here. We have to balance private property rights and maintaining neighborhood character. I don't think neighborhood approval of a plan um, of a home that's going to be built in their neighborhood is the way to go for that. Um, that really tramples all over private property rights as far as I'm concerned. But what I have talked about and I've talked with, 
with neighbors about this, and I've talked with builders about this who do the infill development that, that we want in our neighborhoods. Um, about having some design guidelines for maintaining neighborhood character and exactly what that will look like. And when the mayor asked me when we were, we were meeting before he endorsed me, what is the one thing that you wanna do in the, in the first year as council member? That's what I said. I said, we need to have design guidelines that are very clear for maintaining neighborhood character. And we need to have everybody at the table, neighbors and, and builders alike, to come up with those design guidelines so that we can maintain neighborhood character, but at the same time, preserve private property rights. Uh, we have another question in the same category, but since it's in the same category, we'll just continue in the same way. This one is from someone who's actually here, Chris R. on Camino Ramon and Willow Glen. And I'm gonna paraphrase because it's a long paragraph. But he says, hey, in, in, in the light of worsening housing crisis, would you consider what Los Angeles does and allow subdividing lots within traditional neighborhoods because you'd get another house and provide more units? So the question is, would you sub support subdividing lots in an R18 neighborhood? And that, we'll go with Helen. Again, that's something that, you know, I think that has to be considered carefully because, um, you know, in, an, in a, an area like Buena Vista, if you subdivide a lot there and you, you know, you take one large lot and you put in four houses, you are adding an awful lot of traffic onto a very narrow street. So I think, you know, it's, there's, there's not one size that fits all on this. This is something that needs to be carefully considered. Context matters. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't want to, there's a very large home with a very large lot that's for sale on Pine Avenue. Many of you may be familiar with it. I don't want to see that lot subdivided and that house, that beautiful, beautiful house torn down. Whether or not it's historic, I want somebody who wants to come into the community to buy that house and, and live in it and treat it with, with the care and, and concern that the previous owners did in, in renovating that, that beautiful house. So I really think that um, even though four houses could be built on that same lot. So I really think that context matters. In other cases, there are some, some large lots where it makes sense to subdivide the lot and build two homes. There was a large lot on Co Avenue near my street where there was a small home on, on a lot that could have had two homes. When it got sold, it did get subdivided and there are two um, larger homes on that on that property now, it's two separate properties now, and it's actually been fine for the neighborhood. We, we, have so, we gained two lovely neighbors, so I think really mat context matters in this case about what the lot is like, what the homes around it are like, and, and whether it's something like in the, on, in the case of the, the Pine Avenue home, whether it's something that really adds so much to the neighborhood that we would never want to subdivide it regardless of how much additional property tax revenue we would get from a subdivision. And I can let the late, uh, our potential uh, future council members know and the audience know that you can bring a subdivided lot to the city council and have about 40 people show up angry. Uh, or you can have a 200 unit on two acres and you get two people that show us up. So subdividing lots is very passionate for some people. But that's just like dog parks and park commission. There you go. Uh, this will stay on the housing. This is from Arvind, A-R-V-I-N-D, in Georgetown, uh, on Georgetown, in Cahill Park. And uh, this one, I think, is going to be Dev. Is that, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on density of new housing developments? Would you increase density to increase supply and help with affordability? So, again, it depends on where it is. I support density just like the general plan supports density in the urban villages and along transit corridors. I think that just makes sense for a large city. We know that Manhattan is very dense. Um, for a large city to, to have dense housing because we, need, we do need to increase supply and we don't have additional land. Um, and there, are, there is green space that we want to preserve in Coyote Valley, in mid Coyote Valley, in the Green Belt in Coyote Valley. And, and even in North Coyote Valley, there is no housing designated for any of that space because we don't want to sprawl out farther uh, than we already are. So the way to go is really to get more dense. 
I know that area very well, uh, and I think the you know density is good. But again, as I stated earlier, you need the infrastructure to keep up with the density. You need that public transportation access. There's an awful lot of building going on in the Midtown area. You have the Fairfield project. You have Ohlone. You already have the existing projects over at Georgetown and Plant 51, and there is no real public transportation that, that moves you around. You can get to Deer Dawn Station if you want to walk, but as we prepare for an aging population, not all of us are going to just hike over two miles to our train station and carry our suitcase overhead. Um, you know, so this is why I'm proposing extending the downtown dash from downtown to Santana Row, and so that we have a shuttle, you know, maybe at a small cost or subsidized, um, so that it allows that extra public transportation option so that we can get to shopping from either of those locations, I think would help bring people to Santana Row, bring people to downtown for various things. And it gets you using public transportation, not necessarily feel, but he feels that the bus is the best, the best thing. But I think um, that's where density is going. And again, they also have to keep in mind you need to find that park space and those trail access. And I, so I'm glad to see Del Monte Park is expanding because you do, you're going to need that space then to accommodate all the units in there. And just as a quick follow-up for both of you, does a bus line count as transportation or do we always have to fi think about fixed rail like light rail? Helen, please. I think, you know, with technology expanding so right, with self-driving cars, there's going to be a plethora of options. I think, you know, what we've planned for in the last 10 years, we're not keeping up with transportation. And I really think we need to sit down and really expand our options because we are just not keeping up. We are very good at the density and building development, but we're not keeping up with transportation technology. And Dev, same question. So if the bus lines went where people want to go, a bus line would count. Uh, right now, VTA needs to get a lot better before we should say a bus line is a transit corridor. All right. So the next one is from me. <laughs> um, setting the scene here for you. A developer recently filed to rezone one out of 20 acres of privately owned land in Almaden Valley from open space to residential and build eight to 12 units of market rate housing on it. In exchange, the remaining 19 acres would become dedicated open space for the public and a trail would be built connecting Almaden Lake Park to the um, Santa Teresa County Park. Would you support a general plan amendment to rezone the one acre to residential in exchange for securing 19 acres of public open space? Please explain your reason, and we'll start with Helen. This is one of those cases I would like to meet with the neighbors first before I just give a yes or no, and I would like to see the plans. Um, you know, being on the Neighborhood Association for a long time, we looked at those development review plans. Being a park commissioner, those were some of the things that we did before um, the plans went to council. We would make a recommendation as a park commissioner whether or not, you know, that was an adequate number of space. We didn't get into the design element, but we certainly got into the zoning portion of it and, and what the open space requirement was. So before making a yes or no, I would really like to know much more about the plans and know what the surrounding community feels about it. I just want to make sure I understand. Eight houses for 19 acres of open space. Eight, That's to, eight to 12. Eight to 12. Even 12 houses for 19 acres of open space and a brand new trail. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Um, someone willingly giving up 19 acres of their private property to be public land. Uh, that's not something... That's not a deal that comes along very often, and it's probably, given what we've talked about with the space constraints in San Jose, that's not a deal that's likely to ever come along again. I say we take that deal. Okay, I think we're on 10, right? Okay. Uh, this is from Mike on Codenberg in Willow Glen, and he wants to ask questions about Measure G, the business tax that's on the November ballot, and he said he was reading the proposal online, and he noticed that there's going to be a business tax on rental property. And then uh, he says they own a unit that's below market value because they believe they need to provide reasonable rents for people to work in San Jose. But at the same time, Measure G is going to increase his taxes and inevitably will pass it on to the renter. Um, how do you deal with this conundrum? And that's to Dev. 
I think that is tricky, but um, I am supporting Measure G. We have not modernized our business tax for 30 years, so it's been exactly the same dollar amount in 30 years. So you can imagine that uh, the purchasing power of, that, of those dollars has decreased over that amount of time. So this is the way to... Measure G modernizes the, the business tax, includes rental property, and also caps the increase every year. So it does increase over time uh, based on the consumer price index, but it's capped at 2.5%, which is a low rate. If we ever have high inflation, it's not going to increase a lot. And that actually, um, that increase is lower than, than the amount of allowed, allowed increase in uh, rental rates for for uh, rent controlled units so it is it is a tough one because the the landlord is going to pass along that um, that tax but it is still at a very low rate for rental units um, especially if there are, there is a um, just a single rental unit or fewer than than four apartments so um, I, I am supporting the business tax and it will be a low rate of increase every year I also do support Measure G. Um, there are, you know, some pitfalls and payoffs, but it is time to upgrade the business tax. Again, it's been 30 years, and you know, enough tax has been coming on to the t to the residential to resident owners. And you know, we've had our share of sales tax and and bonds, and so we're paying our fair share. And I think it's time that we start looking elsewhere, you know, for the income that we need and do in, in, in order to improve our infrastructure and our general fund. General fund. Thank you. Uh, back to now. It's the second opportunity to ask your uh, council, your colleague, your candidate colleague, a question. And it, it, again, it's uh, back to you on that one, Helen. Okay. What's your favorite movie? <laughs> so ten years ago, I probably would have said The Breakfast Club, um, but which is still a great movie, and I've watched it recently. But uh, I actually answered this question when we had the first Carl Gardino, and <laughs> it's Legally Blonde. I like all movies with, um, with really strong female leads, and Al Woods is the, the main character in that movie. If you haven't seen it, you totally should. Um, but she's someone who is, you can't, you can't judge her by the way she looks. She's, she's got a lot going on, and she also is one of the, she's kind of like the unsinkable Molly Brown. She is a spirit that, uh, that doesn't let anything get her down for very long. I knew there was a question, I ask you every question. Like. And then Deb, you have an op your second opportunity to ask a question. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about are um, a number of, of tax increases, and I've been endorsed by Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility, and the Merck has also said that they think I have a good fiscal sense and will will watch out for um, fiscal issues in the city. I'm wondering, I, I am basically at my breaking point right now for, for which measures to vote on um, in terms of increasing taxes. For you, what, at what point is enough is enough for more taxes? Oh, that's a good question. I know because I think we're almost approaching a 10% sales tax, and I think that's a little bit scary to me. Um, you know, when we hit that that double-digit number, and at that point, really, you know, are we taxing ourselves out of San Jose? And what are we doing? You know, so good. I have two sons living with me. Is this affordable for them? And I hear too many people saying, you know, that San Jose is increasingly becoming unaffordable. So I think, you know, we do have to look at all other options, you know, looking at state grants and looking at other ways of bringing in income, um, not necessarily just, you know, taxes. All right, thank you. So we now move on to a question from Terrence on Glendale in Willow Glen. Terrence asks, what can you say about yourself that gives voters assurance that you are independent and free from in influence of special interests, including, biz including business and unions? What can you say about your opponent and why you think they may not have the independence that you do from these special interests? And we start with Dev. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So um, I think the, the assurance that I can give you is that I've, I've already 
proven myself to be independent. You can look at all my answers to the 70 questions, and there are some that I think business groups would agree with and some that business groups wouldn't agree with. I'm endorsed by the chamber, so that's the one that you would maybe worry that I was beholden to. I'm the kind of person who makes the decision based on all of the facts, and I want everybody, all of the stakeholders to be at the table. So that's why I'm not supporting Measure E, for example, because it's a measure that didn't take business groups into account. They're, they weren't involved in the process of crafting Measure E, even though it impacts businesses. Um, and I'm supporting Measure G, which increases taxes on businesses. Um, so there are, there are a number of things where it's very obvious that I, I'm not just a knee-jerk person in, ter in terms of the way I make decisions. I'm always going to come back to the facts and make decisions that way. I have said at many, many forums, and I will continue to say, my special interest is the community and the neighborhoods. That's where I come from, and that's what I've been working hard for the last 20, almost 26 years now, because I've been running for a campaign for a year, so the 25 needs to be up to 26. Um, I've done a lot for the community, and it's sometimes at the expense of the businesses, and sometimes at the expense of labor. You know, when you take on the parkland dedication ordinance, and you raise the fees from 70% on the dollar to 100% on the dollar, you have some people that are probably, you know, not too happy with you, you know. But I did it because the community deserves to have the money funded for parks and library, parks and trails and community centers. That's what's most important, and I'm willing to do that hard work. I built a park in the Rose Garden neighborhood, and that was, you know, contentious between Hoover Middle School at the time because they gave up a tennis court. But in the end, when the principal comes back to me ten years later, ten years later, and says that was the right thing to do because now we have a park for small children in the neighborhood, you know that was a battle. And so sometimes you're going, you know, you're going to do things that maybe aren't the most popular, but in the end, it's going to serve the community, and that's where my heart is, and that's why I have over 550 endorsements, and over half those endorsements are for residents that live within the district because they know me and they have worked with me. All right. This next one is from me, and it's about parks. It used to cost about 4.2 million annually to maintain all small parks across the city, a uh, small park being defined as uh, two acres or less, right? Yeah. Um, the cost is now approximately 1.3 million since outsourcing the work to a private company, saving almost 3 million each year that can be used to hire more police or pave roads. Do you support continuing to use these private companies instead of city workers? And we will start with Helen. As long as the contracts by the companies are using these parks, and for example, Theodore Lenzen Park is one of those small parks that has a company that does it. As long as they adhere and work with the volunteers at that park and do the service that they are that they are signed up to do, I have no problem. With it. But if they have to be closely monitored and have to be come back and say, no, that job wasn't done, or this wasn't done to code, or this wasn't done right, then, then there's a problem. But then you call into question the contract with the person that's doing doing the work. And so I think that's that's the key to outsourcing is you want to make sure that you're getting quality performance in return. Um, you know, it's maybe it may cost less in the long in the short run, but in the long term, you know, are we going to be paying for it in terms of you know more renovations because we're not keeping up with say the padding underneath the swings? So is that a, a yes or? A yep, I think I said yes. The question was, it used to cost about 4.2 million annually, annually to maintain all small parks across the city. It is now about 1.3 million since the work was outsourced to a private company, saving almost 3 million each year that can be used to hire more police or pave roads. Do you support continuing to use these pri private companies instead of city workers? So my quick math says that's about a 75% savings on uh, maintenance for small parks. That is a really good deal. Uh, I do think we, we need to make sure that, that they're meeting their contractual ob obligations and also uh, taking a look at those contracts and making sure that we've included everything that we actually want done. I, we live near a small park, Hummingbird Park, and there is some maintenance that 
probably should be in the contract that I think is not in the contract. So maybe increasing it a little bit um, to make sure that we get all the maintenance that we need so that our, for example, a fence that was broken would get fixed in a very timely manner instead of being broken for a very long time and having the neighborhood take it take it upon itself to to go out and actually weld something together so uh, it's probably not the way to go but um, having those contracts be for the right tasks and then be managed appropriately that gives us a good amount of savings again a 75 percent savings three million dollars paves a lot of roads all right so moving on to roads this one also is for me. I promise I don't have too many more of mine. <laughs> the transportation department has said it needs 100 million annually over 10 years to keep the city's pavement network in good condition. The current deficit is 521 million. Unless more money is secured, deferred maintenance costs could hit 1.8 billion in eight years. San Jose used to exempt affordable housing development from paying these road paving fees as a way to promote this type of housing. The council will consider this exemption again. Would you support this exemption? And we are starting with Dev. This is a tricky one because we do need more affordable housing, but if we pass the bond um, for $950 million, which is a countywide bond for affordable housing, that fills in the gap so that the federal money can be tapped to build more affordable housing. We have to have our infrastructure keep up. We've been talking about this actually all night. We have to have our infrastructure keep up with the additional people who come to live in San Jose. So every time we build housing, uh, we're gonna have to maintain our roads uh, even better. And we do have a very large deficit and we're continuing to build on that deficit. We've spent of the $100 million annually that we're supposed to be spending. Last year we spent $17 million. This year we have budgeted $35 million. If Measure B passes, which is a transportation measure, we can actually increase that by $30 million a year to get to $65 million. We're still a ways away from $100 million a year to, to actually maintain our roads at the, the quality that, that they should be maintained. So I do think we should revisit that exemption because People who live in, in affordable housing use the roads as well. Uh, I think it's a good idea to revisit the exemption, but not just for the affordable housing. I would like it to, to also in North First Street where we have given discounts to developers and companies, and again, for not paying that infrastructure fee. Um, because again, they use the they use the roads. You know, the companies use the roads just like we do, and the large developers. So I think it's something that we should uh, look at as a, a citywide. Okay, this one is uh, based on a question from Steve on Shasta and Shasta Hanchett. It's about our fire department. He has a concern about both county ambulances and the city fire department respond to emergency calls. He finds that redundant. So then the question has been worded uh, by Julia. More than 90% of service calls, service calls for the fire department are medical related. Under state law, county governments are required to provide what's called advanced life support. Currently, the city spends $35 million annually for advanced life support. Only $5 million of that is reimbursed by the county. Do you think the county should assume the full responsibility under state law or fully compensate the city for its service, for this service and its cost? And I think this one was Helen, correct? I think there certainly could be a better partnership between the city and the county. And as you know, we haven't always had that great partnership between the city and county. There's times that you know, we've sued each other back and forth. Um, there is something to look at. If you do have duplicate services, especially when it comes to uh, police and fire, that's something to look at. And again, that would be something I'd want to make sure um, was acceptable both to the county and to the, the city. Would you say you lean one way or the other? Should the county fully compensate the city for providing the service that the city's doing today? Or should the city say, county, it's your responsibility under state law, you do it? I'm leaning to looking at it, not understanding the process well enough. I would, I'm leaning to be to open to looking at it. Yeah. Well, it's not an answer, but Dev. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like the county saves $30 million a year by the city participating and, and helping with, with some of these first responder services. 
I actually don't care either way whether the county reimburses us or whether the county just takes on the the job themselves, I think that's something that we would need to negotiate with the county, but I think we need to make it very clear that if the state has given the county that responsibility, then we're actually coming from a position of strength when we're negotiating by saying, hey, it's either one or the other. We've been giving you guys a free ride for a really long time. And by the way, we have some fiscal issues in our city and it would really help us out if you could either reimburse us or take, a, take this on we have half of the county's population. So the county is getting a lot of savings by, by San Jose taking on some of this ref first responder duties. And we need to share, share in the responsibility. And really, as it sounds like, the, the county needs to take the responsibility that the state has given them. All right, and this one is from David on Campbell Avenue in Willow Glen. David asks, what is the primary benefit you bring to city government that your opponent does not? And we are starting with Dev. I've talked about this a little bit before. My ability and uh, the way that I, my analytical ability and the way that I look at problems and solve problems is very fact-based. That's the way I learned to do that was as a Stanford uh, researcher, I do education research there and have for the last 12 years. And also in my training as uh, getting my master's in public policy at Stanford, we're taught to take all of the facts and take all of the information, get everybody to the table and to make the most objective decision possible because that's what makes the best policy. That's what helps the most people. And I have the training to do that. I have a number of studies actually that I did during my graduate work on local issues that are on my website at devdavis.com. So you can see how I think about problems and how I approach them um, just on my website. Yes. Um, you know, I bring a wealth of experience, and that comes from doing projects within the neighborhood and within the city. If you build a park, you have to go through the process. You can't just say, I'm going to build a park, and this guy's going to turn over his tennis court, and it's just going to happen. You have to negotiate. You have to work with the system, and you have to know who to, who to navigate to and who to talk with. You know, And doing the Alameda project, that was a 20-year project in terms we didn't even know we could get state relinquishment money to repave the road until we had a conversation with then assembly member. Jim Bell. I just had a recent conversation with State Assembly Member Evan Lowe, who endorsed my campaign, and said every September, every February, I ask City Council in terms of what their wish list is for state funding, and I don't get much of a response. I can guarantee you, I will give him a list of things that we could use in terms of state funding, in terms of traffic calming, because our traffic calming units are down, in terms of road repair. There's a lot of things that we could be advocating for. Those endorsements mean more to me than just the name. It's the connection that I have with the person, and they know the work that I do, and that I will leverage into a partnership that will help advocate for a stronger San Jose. I'd just like to point out the majority of the city council is endorsed by some assembly member or state senator. So those relationships exist, but our freeways are still pretty dirty and other things. Oh, look, now you guys can ask each other another question. <laughs> Let's start with, are we starting with Helen this time? Helen. Helen. <laughs> Um, are you looking forward to the forums being over? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> as I'm sure you are as well. Okay. I do. I have another question. Um, it just came up again today. And I think it's just really to give, to give you an opportunity to, to let people know, because I'm sure that you are doing this. I just, we haven't had a chance to talk about it. Um, some of your supporters are continuing to spread the lie that I'm supporting Trump. And I'm curious as to what you say to them when you, because I know you know that I don't support Trump and never have. Um, and so I'm curious what you say to them when they, when they do that. 
I, I'm still astounded that I'm, that I'm hearing that because I know we've, we've talked about this several times and no, uh, anybody that I know and I can tell you and I look at my son who's in the audience right here has walked every 117 precincts with me and I can think he can pretty much attest to the fact that we don't talk about uh, Trump at the door so I don't really know where it's coming from and you know and it, I apologize if it's happening but I have no clue. Okay, these are yes, no questions. This is from the Transparency Project. So these are prior city council items that came to council. And we'll start back on uh, September 2015 when the project started. And the question before the council was whether or not to approve a new 500,000 square foot office building at Santana Row. And that's to Helen. I know it's yes or no, but is this the one where the gas station sits? And this is one that was approved a year ago at so Santana Road. On the other side. Okay, yes. Dev? Yes. I think I would vote the same way. I think I voted yes back then. <laughs> this one was from November 2015. Um, would you vote to divert park fee monies derived from new residential developments from capital uses to maintenance and activation of St. James Park. Dev. No. No. December 8th, allow places of worship to shelter up to 15 homeless individuals immediately without neighborhood approval. And that's to Helen. Yes. Yes. And again, all of my explanations are on my website for all of these. December 2015. How do you feel, yes or no, about a study creating a new fee on new commercial development to fund low-income housing? And that's deaf. No. This was the commercial impact fee? No. And then this is another one. So, so one year later, another Santana Row project approved zoning for new Santana Row West, which is three office buildings, retail and grocery store. Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> All right. And this one is from Joan on Quail Hollow Drive in Pamlar. Joan writes... You both say affordable housing is a big issue facing the city of San Jose. One of the last affordable places to live are mobile home parks, where individuals can own their own home while paying rent for the space. The situation with the Winchester Mobile Home Park is threatening the future of the other mobile home parks in San Jose. What are you willing to do as council members to help thousands of mobile homeowners? And we are starting with Dev. So for those of you who aren't um, aware of what's happening at the Winchester Mobile Home Park, the owner, it's, it's a family that owns that, that park. It's not a, a large corporation or anything like that. It's simply a family that, that owns that mobile home park. And what they want to do is, in, in accordance with the general plan uh, of Santana Row and Winchester Boulevard being an urban village, they want to develop that site to have more dense housing. And what, the, what I understand is the offer on the table is that the, the owner has offered to purchase and has even begun purchasing some of the, the units as people, as tenants cycle out or as owners cycle out of, of the mobile home park. And an offer to purchase the units and then build a condo on site which would only displace three or four of the current tenants um, while it was being built. They would need to move to some of the other empty mobile homes on the, on the property um, and then allow them to, to live in the condos for the same amount of rent uh, that they have now owning their, renting their space. So. I, this to me seems like a really good deal for both the owners, the property owners, and the mobile home owners. I think it's actually setting a really good precedence of communicating and working together, keeping people in their homes for as long as possible, and then keeping them in the same area for the rest of their lives. That to me looks like a really good deal, 
at the same time as we've been talking about needing to have more dense housing, it, it builds more dense housing for the future in that area, which is right next to what we just talked about is three office buildings where there will be a number of people needing places to live near where they work. I've been very consistent on my feelings on mobile home parks. I've walked them. I can tell you, mobile homes are part of our affordable housing stock, and we need to keep them. I don't believe in the opt-in policy, and it would not to support it. We need to keep the people in the mobile home parks now. Many of them are on fixed incomes or are disabled, and they don't have an alternative to be able to move into a higher rented unit. We would be displacing lots of people that way, and we already have issues with displacement. So I support mobile homes, and I support keeping them in San Jose. Yes? I just want to be clear. Again, they're not the current uh, thing that we were talking about was that the Winchester Mobile Home Park, which would actually not displace the residents. It would keep them on site in the same, with the same financial situation that they, that they currently have. They would be able to rent a brand new condo for the same amount that they're paying for their mobile home space, which is about $800 to $1,200 a month. And the City Council will take this up probably in 2017, so that one of you will be able to uh, uh, determine that one. Uh, this one is from Diana. She's on Keesling and Willow Glen, and I think this is going to be of Helen. Um, are, you bleh, are you supportive of adopting community choice energy in San Jose, and do you support a public management model or a private management model? And the City Council will be having a study session on this item at the end of the month. Yes, uh, good question. Yes, I support community energy choice, and I support a public model. I have not uh, gotten to see the study yet. I did vote, by the way, to approve this study. This was one of the questions many months ago about whether to approve a study for community choice energy. I think it's definitely work look, worth looking at. So for those of you who don't know what community choice energy is, we're actually um, considering, it's from state law from I think 2012 or sometime before that, that it allows the community to purchase, the, ci the city, to purchase energy as a wholesaler as opposed to having each individual home purchase energy through PG&E. So the idea is usually to increase the amount of renewable energy that's part of the portfolio. PG&E is required to have 30% of their uh, energy portfolio be renewables. Usually what happens, so Marin and, and other uh, cities and counties have done this already, usually what happens is the, the, the package that's on offer, the base package is 50% renewable and then you can opt in to uh, up to 100% renewable if you want to want to pay a little bit more. So you have the opportunity to, to buy completely renewable energy if you want. Um, I think it's a really interesting model, um, a way to cut out uh, PG&E because you wouldn't necessarily need, if you had a, uh, either whether it's public or private, you could, you could make sure it was a nonprofit and so that would cut out the amount of profit that, that PG&E gets by making the city the wholesaler. And again, I would like to see what the results of the study are before I make a a strong determination about that, but I think it's a really intriguing idea and a way for us to to opt in to having more renewables as part of our energy purchase, if we like. All right, this next one is from Kevin on Downing Avenue in Palmar. He says, I've lived near Bascom Avenue for the past 23 years, and I've seen some redevelopment occur over that time, particularly with the Bascom Library and Community Center. However, I was particularly enthused when I saw the long-term plans for redeveloping Bascom Avenue between Moore Park and Southwest Expressway. How will you use your influence as the District 6 City Council member to move the development plans? What do you envision for this area in terms of the redesign of the street, such as road diet trees, and the development of Dick's Shopping Center to make this area a vibrant community that encourages walking and biking? And we're starting with uh, Deb. 
I think the Bascom Avenue uh, has so much potential and there are a few things. One, it's really important for us to streamline our planning and permitting processes, not only for the development on Bascom, but development citywide. We are a city that is uh, known to have a reputation for being unfriendly to businesses and unfriendly to, to bringing jobs here. So. We need to do that to develop Bascom Avenue. We need to do that to develop all of our urban villages. Streamlining planning and permitting is, is really a very basic thing. Doesn't sound sexy, but that's what I want to work on because it will help speed along all of these projects, not just Bascom Avenue. Um, in terms of Bascom Avenue specifically, there does need to be, uh, street trees would be fantastic. There are definitely needs to be more crosswalks. A number of uh, people in the Pamlar neighborhood did mention that, that it's very difficult for them to actually get to the Bascom Library and Community Center from where they are because there aren't a lot of crosswalks across very busy and very wide Bascom Avenue. Having some trees in the middle of the street I think would be a great way to do some traffic calming without actually having to, to take out any lanes. And it's a very wide street, so I would like to see some bike lanes. I'm a big proponent, for those of you who don't know, I'm a big proponent of complete streets where you have the option to walk, you have the option to bike, and you can still drive on those streets as well. Um, those of you who don't know, Bascom Community Center Library, I was one of the people that helped advocate to make sure that we got the Bascom Community Center Library open. Um, and it's been a big boon to the people in the area because I know they love it when I walked around the area. And it's very well used and it's great to see. Um, Bascom Avenue is one of three urban village plans along with the Alameda, West San Carlos, and Bascom. And depending on how fast the urban village plans move along, it might be 10 years from now by the time we get to Bascom because the Alameda plans are only just going to planning commission in a few weeks and then on to council for approval. And that started, I think, about five years ago. So it, it's moving at a snail's pace to see where it goes. So there's plenty of time still for input on terms of what you want to see along Bascom. I know that the, the Dick Shopping Center where Zorba's is, I remember going to Zorba's years ago, it would be nice to see some terms of maybe some local business enhancement, um, maybe a grocery store. I've heard that from people. And again, you want to make sure that there's adequate crosswalks going across from the neighborhood over to the shopping center, which there aren't now, but I understand they're coming, and to make sure and add and the addition of street trees. Uh, one plan, there was plans to put a park and across from the Bascom Library, um, and I don't believe those park plans are going forward anytime soon, but anytime what we can find designated some land for a park would be wonderful to have because that neighborhood doesn't have a great deal of park access. Uh, that parcel across from the park will be a medic medical office building, and then Pamlar Avenue and Bascom will get a new traffic signal, so there'll be another safe connection. But uh, Kevin's question, Julia, he basically is really saying, what are you going to use your influence to, to push development? And how do you see yourself as a council member pushing development on Bascom Avenue? If I can just follow up with Helen and then Dev. I think it's moving forward the urban village plans and it's reinvigorating that process because it seems to have stalled. Um, I haven't seen much going on the way of the, with the West San Carlos plans right now. I know, as I said, the Alameda is only just going forward and having going through that with planning, that has been a good process, but I see the other two's lagging and I think we need to reinvigorate and bring more people into the process. There's probably several new residents that don't even know what's planned for Bascom at this point. Well, in terms of the development, I think I would want to first talk to the developers that are interested in that area and see what's holding them up. One of the things I do think we need to do is uh, do away with the phasing of the urban villages. And it was, a, it was an artificial phasing to begin with to say, these urban villages have to go first before these urban villages go. Um, and I, I don't think that makes sense if the, if the market determines that urban villages that are designated for phase two need to be happening before phase one, then we should allow that to happen. Bascom and Hamilton is a very vibrant area, and I see no reason why we shouldn't start developing that, even though it may be later on in the queue than, than other urban villages that have been stalled. Going to our auxiliary questions. Not, one more question. not so fast. <laughs> okay. A good one, oh, really good one. Oh, no pressure there. Um, okay. I'm going to go with this one then. This one is from Jeff on Iris Court in Willow Glen. Jeff writes, the former 
uh, I hope I'm not saying this wrong, Al Alano, Alano Club property on Minnesota between the library and Lincoln Avenue has been proposed to be converted from office to residential multiple times and Pure Luigi has blocked it. <laughs> Do you support office or converting to residential at this location? And we're starting with Dev. Or, I, th I think we're starting with Helen, okay. <laughs> Okay, so let me understand, it's currently office now? Currently zoned office. It's currently zoned office? But everyone wants residential. Well, not everyone, the developers want residential. Yes, I think I've clearly stated this. I, you know, I agree with you on the employment land conversion and making sure I would stick with the blocking, yes. So I actually had uh, a, an idea for this space. There are, there are currently two very dilapidated office buildings. Um, they're single story office buildings in this area. They've been for sale for as long as I can remember. 10 years. I've been, there you go. We bought our house in uh, Willow Glen in 2008 and we've been walking that way to go to the library that entire time with our kids. So it's been empty that entire time. Um, we hear a lot about parking on Lincoln Avenue being an issue. And I think it would be great if we had someone who purchased both of those, um, both of those lots and had uh, similar to the town square on the Willow Lincoln side, would would actually build a little bit of a town square as well as two-story parking in that area would also ease some of the, the traffic congestion that, that people talk about on Lincoln Avenue that I don't really experience, but um, I know people like to park at the ends of Lincoln Avenue to to do their business, and, and that would be a, a great place to have some parking if you're going to be doing your going to be doing your business closer to, to Minnesota on Lincoln Avenue than, than on Willow. All right, we've covered a variety of topics. Our candidates are, uh, you know, they've, they're, they're champions. They've powered through a year of campaigning. They're, uh, they're, they're near the finish line. I encourage you to have as much strength as possible for the remaining weeks. Uh, now we'll go with our closing for 60 seconds, and I believe, uh, Helen, you started, so then I think Dev then would go first on the closing. I think that's correct, yep. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you, Julia and Pierre Luigi, for moderating yet another forum. Um, we've lost count in, as to how many forums we've actually done. Pierre Luigi's hosted three of them, and we've done, I don't know, over a dozen. But I am so grateful to have had these many opportunities to share with you all of the things that I've done in the community and about myself. Um, whether it's raising money for resources for foster, uh, foster youth and their families, advocating for state laws against human trafficking, um, or building a playground in the Sherman Oaks neighborhood or helping to build one. Can't do a, a playground single-handedly. Um, I've been so happy to be part of the San Jose community and part of the, the District 6 community since we moved here in 2008. I really would appreciate the opportunity to continue serving you as your council member for District 6. Thank you again for coming tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Pierre Luigi, and thank you, Julia, for hosting, and thank you, eBay, for this wonderful venue, and everybody in the audience for sitting through yet another candidate forum. Um, it's been a pleasure. When you vote, you know, in a few weeks, or people are actually starting to vote now. What I want you to think in mind is the person with the most experience that can start on day one, that can take those connections and that experience and start to work for you. That person is Helen Chapman. My website is HelenChapman2016.com. You can check out the information. Um, I have been working in the community for over 25 years. I have no intention of stopping now. I want to bring that passion that I have for neighborhoods and communities and bring it forward to you. And that's my drive, and that's what keeps me going. And walking all those precincts and serving you, because again, it's, when I say working for you, I really, really heartfully mean it. And again, it's been a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to voting day. Thank you so much. Thanks again to our candidates and your husbands uh, for, and their, your families for supporting you and all your friends. Thank you to eBay. Thank you to our studio audience. And if you'd like a copy of the District 6 Candidate Transparency Project, I have it here in paper at the front of the stage. Thank you all so much and have a beautiful evening.